Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Today we have three stories for you. One of them is about revenge in the army. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Followed brand identity rules when told not to by sales staff. I spent about 20 years in the sign and advertising industry, primarily in design and production, so I am very familiar with rules regarding brand identity and logos. I had been at the same company for about 15 years, worked my way up from being an outdoor installer to being the primary structural and visual designer for the company. We were a small company, 35 or so employees. The sales staff was never more than two or three dedicated salespeople, usually one for petroleum accounts and the other one or two handled commercial accounts and private customers and one-off sales. Around 2010 or so, they promoted one of our sales guys to a managerial position, so they had to hire a new salesperson. I will call him Dingus. He was an older guy, initially pleasant enough, but he quickly began to grate on the rest of the shop due to his unwillingness to learn the ins and outs of our products and not getting thorough surveys, which always caused problems when the job sold and went to production. This became enough of a problem that we started following up on his surveys on our own to make sure they were correct. One day, Dingus came to me with a proposal for some signage for an industrial campus for a fairly large agricultural corporation. Nothing gigantic, mostly a bunch of non-illuminated wayfinder signage with logos and colors to match the brand. But there were a lot of them, and they were easy to build, so it would be a pretty profitable job in the end. I put together a package and emailed everything over to Dingus. He sent an email back to me saying, that I needed to change the colors on the logos and iconography to two completely different schemes not included in the brand guidelines. He said that the person he was working with at the company had requested those colors. I replied that they needed to consult with their corporate marketing department to authorize the change per their brand identity. I made it a point to tell him that if we produced these signs with altered brand identity, we were opening our shop to the possibility of reworking every sign at minimum and possibly stepping on some toes legally. He told me to disregard their forms and do it anyway, and that I'd better have a revised package ready for him on Monday to send to the customer. This guy wasn't my boss, and his rudeness pissed me off. I put together the new package using the colors he requested. I made sure to call out the PMS colors on all layouts with notations in the descriptions so there would be no doubt that this was a deliberate change. I then emailed a very nicely worded email to the sales guy and CC'd a copy to the customer's marketing for approval as is standard for our shop and their brand. I made sure to ask them to contact us with any corrections that needed to be made and provided the appropriate phone numbers for Dingus and myself on the email. Monday rolls around and I get called into the office. Dingus and the owner slash CEO begin grilling me about going over Dingus's head to the customer and how my email had caused an issue between corporate and the local manager who had requested the changes. I told my boss that I had been specifically told to disregard the customer's brand identity and I had made the changes as requested. I then pointed out the instructions from corporate marketing that said all advertising must be sent to them for approval. As I was the primary designer, I was authorized to do this since any feedback from marketing would come to me for revisions anyway. I pointed out that I was never told not to send the specs for approval and that it was part of my job to make sure that my designs would meet with customer specs. Since the on-site manager said it was okay and I had emails telling me this was the case, I had no reason to think that this would be an issue. I knew damn well this wasn't the case, but I played dumb. As it turned out, the on-site manager just didn't like the corporate color scheme and wanted to do his own thing since he was the king of his little fiefdom. Dingus just wanted the sale and was willing to break copyright rules to get it. My email exposed they were trying to end run around corporate just to get the sale done. The owner slash CEO called corporate and confirmed I had followed their rules to the letter and that changes to their brand identity were not allowed without explicit approval from them. I was told I had done nothing wrong, and Dingus got an extensive lecture and barely avoided being fired, but was gone a few months later. We still got the job once I corrected all the colors back. And our second story. Try and ruin my project? I'll end your jobs. Background. 
I was a contract programmer brought in to solve a failed software initiative to bridge the gap between an old banking system and a new type of business dealing with trading accounts in the 1990s. I successfully replaced their stopgap of complicated spreadsheets that lost trades and created a nightmare and created a robust system to allow the data input and trades to follow a rule set. This rule set allowed for adjustments as needed but followed a standardized way of processing that met regulatory and accounting requirements. The work flowed in from data input sourced from printed reports from the mainframe, went to a QCQ, flowed to the correct traders, and etc. The endpoint would generate a series of reports, spreadsheets, emails, and hand entered back into the main system. The receiving department could even import a file but insisted on re-entering the data. Everyone in my projects department was thrilled because there were no more mishandled slash missing trades and everything was on time. Since emails were automated, everyone got the reports on distribution, which ended the I didn't get it excuse. The issue. All was well until we needed new information added to the system. My adjustments took a little over a week and I thought all was well until we had a department meeting to review. The data entry people, four persons, complained that it would throw them behind because they memorized keystrokes and the number of tab keys to skip to the next field, etc. Yes, indeed. They did not look at the screen. Suddenly, it became clear that a ton of previous issues could be traced back to them and because they would keep keying away from it would clear any warnings on the screen. They completely stopped the sign-off of the project completion, thus starting to cost me money. The Fallout I made sure that their manager typed up the concerns and forwarded them to their supervising team that included the department supervisor. They eagerly outlined all their gripes and threw me under the bus for their errors, blaming the system. They went on to say how the new changes would put them behind and over their allotted hours. Interestingly enough, they also stated how the four persons were contract and could not add additional contractors without another approval, etc. While this was going on, I added additional reporting to allow management to view all of the data entry that I logged because I'm used to this sort of thing. I then tracked down a number of hot button issues, one of which resulted in a lawsuit. I was able to show where the mistake happened and clearly sourced it to data entry. I shared all this with my reporting manager who was absolutely delighted. It seems another department manager who supervised the data entry people also went in his department. The Revenge Quickly, a management meeting was called and became heated. My poor manager took a beating but sat there with a smile. Once everyone else had exhausted themselves and were sure that they had ended my manager's career, he started by pointing out that the new information was not optional and driven by regulatory. He moved on to include that a new report had been created to send the new data. When asked about the problems the new system caused with missing reports and errors, we produced the reports showing the data entry errors and email logs showing that the emails did indeed get sent out. The other department manager and data entry supervisor were very red-faced. I was then asked by the director if I could make any changes to make this transition easier. I cheerfully explained that once I had the new data entry reporting implemented, I had then created a new program that would scrape the data from the report they were printing, but instead printed to a file. By simply printing to a file, they could avoid the need to manually enter the data and would forever banish the data entry errors. The director and supervisors were ecstatic they could potentially earn bonuses for cutting labor costs. They enthusiastically tasked my manager with implementing the data import. They then instructed that the data entry contractors could be released after a few weeks of implementation. It could have ended there, but I was not done. I also pointed out that I could automate the information from the completed process getting imported back into the mainframe, automate the cross-checking with reporting, and eliminate the data entry tasks. It was a priceless moment. The sheer joy on the face of the director contrasted by the terror of the opposing department managers realizing that in one meeting, their department had disappeared. Aftermath I gained another contract to automate the other department, the data entry supervisor was then tasked with managing the reporting from the new process and her manager was then shifted to another department into his previous role. The department I worked for flourished and went on to win a company award. My direct manager won a great promotion within a year. I could have just eliminated the data entry contractors but felt the need to remove a middleman department. And our last story. Take my flight home? 
Well, I'll take your money. Me is me, do is dumb officer, Lieutenant Colonel. As a new lieutenant in the Army a few years back, I was tasked to be a guest observer, evaluator, at the National Training Center in California. Basically, it's a large desert with small towns for military units to train in before deploying. On day 29, once all evaluations were complete, I was set to fly back to Texas and return to my unit. In the observer slash controller barracks, I was approached by a colonel. Do. Do. Lieutenant Bucks, I'm taking your place on the flight back to Fort XXX. Me. Sir, you're part of the training unit. All of the observers are leaving on this flight and my bags have already been sent to the airfield. I don't have any changes of clothes. Do. You'll be okay for a few days. Officers must innovate to be successful. And innovate, I did. When I returned to my post, I was unable to locate my gear, including body armor, computer, cold weather gear, and other like items due to the fact that they were flown in two days before me on the flight I was kicked off. I informed my command and they initiated an inquiry called a FLIPL, Financial Liability Investigation of Property Loss, in which an investigator is required to determine the reason for lost government property. The investigating officer determined that I was not at fault and that Du abused his authority to return home earlier. Additionally, since I was left at the training center for over 30 days, I was due additional pay for being away for over a month, which amounted to over $1,000. Du was found liable for over $7,000 worth of my equipment and had to pay for it, which I subsequently found and turned into the central issue facility. I was reissued a new set of kit. I bought myself a nice chair and put the rest into my TSP, government equivalent of a 401k, with the extra temporary duty, TDY money. And F-Face got reduced to a staff job. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.